The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to another live edition of What Catholics Believe. My name is Thomas Nagley. I'm your host and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest of the Society of St. Pius V. And he also serves as the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And yourself? Just the same, Father. Great oh, to be good back to see again. You. Yes, another week. <clears throat> Father, uh, any prayer requests to begin the program tonight? As well, there are many and too many to mention individually. Uh, I do ask for the safe travels of Mary and Martha, though, and uh, their safe return. Uh, I do ask uh, for prayers for Art Minges, passed away, and uh, also uh, please keep in your prayers some dear souls who are uh, rather ill. Okay, We uh, ask uh, people to continue praying for Del Subway. Uh, Mother Mary Bosco's brother, who passed on just recently at the rather young age, I think. and. Um, and there are many others who are still uh, struggling for health. I ask for uh, prayers for Joseph Schopacher. Joe uh, underwent surgery today. And uh, also uh, for the grandmother of Jake. Uh, Jake is a recent convert to the faith, and his grandmother just passed away overnight. So um, please keep her in your prayers. Uh, but th there are a goodly an number of other intentions, and God knows who they are. And uh, pray for all those in the Immaculate Heart of Mary prayer list, certainly. Uh, but pray for the speedy recovery of, uh, of uh, actually, Jimmy Gahan and, uh, and also uh, Joe Schopacher mm -hmm. from the surgeries that they're undergoing. They need to be back at their post in, in, good, in good shape. Yeah. Okay. And also young Blaze, as always. Right? Yeah. His little mm -hmm. child who needs their prayers. Yes. Well, thank you, Father. We have um, several things tonight, a mix of uh, current events, some happenings in the news, and also some viewer questions. And um, I thought we could, we could start with uh, a viewer question, Father, that uh, perhaps we can tie in with some current events that were actually in the news just today. Um, some, uh, actually, some of our viewers wanted to know, Father, uh, how you continue to defy, quote-unquote, the Holy Father, Francis. Uh, and the authority of the church by offering mass and administering the sacraments uh, in defiance of church authority, especially when the popes have been willing to grant permission to offer the Latin mass uh, since 1988. How can you continue to defy the Holy Father? Well, you know, Tom, it always uh, amazes me when we have, uh, let's say, a clergyman of the paternity of St. Peter or uh, the Institute of Christ the King or some other uh, Latin mass group, uh, which is approved by the new order, mm -hmm. uh, by the modernist authorities. Um, when, when you have those clergymen basically attack traditional Catholic priests who've gone before them, really, and who continue offering the traditional mass, administering mm -hmm. the traditional sacraments, uh, on what grounds? Well, they say, we have canonical authority, we're okay, we're approved, and you're not, and we have the necessary approval and faculties and, and so on to do this, and you don't. So you're in schism, and, uh, and we're okay. And, uh, and they actually um, <clears throat> cast aspersions on traditional priests who don't have uh, the, uh, let's say, approbation of the Vatican as it is now under Francis, but they do. As they say, it, it, it causes me a certain wonderment because it betrays an enormous ignorance and perhaps a little bit of malice. Um, but I, I'll stick with the ignorance for the time being <clears throat> because were it not for the fact that there were traditional priests who, despite all of the efforts of the quote-unquote authorities in the church, right, from the Vatican on down to crush the traditional Latin Mass, 
for probably 20 years, basically from 1968, 69, 70, until uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the motu proprio or the uh, uh, John Paul II, I say in 1988, mm -hmm. creating the Ecclesia Dei Commission uh, to control the use of the uh, Latin Mass, the 1962 uh, liturgy in the church. Um, the, there was every effort made by the authorities that they're talking about to crush the Latin Mass and to entirely eliminate it. Uh, in the 1970s, 1970s, 80s, um, you had every, everywhere you went as a traditional priest, you were met with opposition, you were uh, condemned, you were told you cannot have that traditional mass, no one can, it's streng verboten, and the Novus Ordo clergy, the New Order clergy, were not allowed to have it anywhere at any time. Uh, the only exceptions might have been elderly priests who were confined to nursing homes in their private rooms. <clears throat> I mean, there was, really was an, an all-out effort uh, by the authorities after Vatican II and after the introduction of the new Mass to completely annihilate, obliterate, wipe from the face of the earth the traditional Latin Mass. <clears throat> and the fact is that if the priests... Whom, uh, whom we now know as the traditional Catholic priests, notably ordained by Marseille Lefebvre, if they had not continued in the face of all of that to continue to offer the traditional Mass and make it available to people, then the Institute of Christ the King and the Fraternity of St. Peter would never have existed in the first place. There would have been no traditional Mass for them to latch on to uh, and to, uh, to receive permission to offer the modernists would have succeeded in annihilating the traditional mass. <clears throat> but for the fact that for all those years, without approval and with constant condemnation uh, hanging over their heads or thunderbolts issuing forth from the modernist Vatican now, they continued practicing the traditional faith and offering it to the people uh, in their catechisms, in, at the altars, in the confessional, and so on. And how they, they now would say, well, now we have approval, so you're all wrong, and you're in schism, and you can't do that legitimately. Well, I'm sorry, uh, but for the fact, the fact of the matter is that you don't know your history. And um, that uh, it's, it's also, I think, even an egregious act of uh, not only disrespect, but a lack, total lack of gratitude for those who really did um, carry carry the torch through that darkness. And um, it was only because Archbishop Lefebvre did ordain priests to offer the traditional Mass, and only the traditional Mass, and to preach the traditional Catholic faith, uh, that um, the Paul the Sixth, actually, uh, Paul the, uh, John Paul the Second even relented in allowing the 1962 liturgy to be offered in 1988 and onward. Um, it was when Monsieur Lefebvre consecrated the bishops that he did that John Paul II felt it necessary to relax the rules and to allow um, a rare 1962 traditional Latin Mass in anywhere, you know, for fear that the, the people would uh, leave the Nova Soto and, and uh, go with wherever the traditional Latin Mass was. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this had to be wrung from the modernists. And now you see Francis is doing everything he can um, to, um, again, try to try to take up that original plan to annihilate the Mass, the traditional Mass. Um, Francis, in his motu proprio, Traditionis Custodes, said, said so. He said explicitly that uh, Benedict XVI, uh, wrote Summorum Pontificum and gave that um, permission for the 1962 Latin liturgy to be offered in, in the hopes that it would actually bring the quote-unquote Latin mass, mass Catholics into the Novus Ordo fold and they would gradually accept the New Order liturgy. That was a, so in other words, it was a, a tactic. 
<clears throat> because they weren't giving up the, the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, the plan was to get them back into the churches where the Novus Ordo was offered and win them over and get them used to it and have them accept it. <clears throat> but Francis said in his Tradiciones Casores, it wasn't working. It failed. If anything, it just, again, fanned the flames of desire for the traditional Latin Mass as become, people became more and more aware of it. <clears throat> um, they became more and more devoted to it and more and more insistent upon it. Francis basically said this was exactly the opposite of what, of what Benedict intended and exactly the opposite of what Samorum Quantificum uh, should have accomplished. And he says it's even gotten to a point where now people who are demanding the traditional or the Latin Mass now are beginning to question Vatican II. You know, mm -hmm. We can't have that. And so in his, uh, in, in his uh, Traditiones Custodes, Francis said there's only one legitimate expression of the Catholic faith right now in the liturgy and the Mass, and that's the New Order Mass of Paul VI. And uh, the, the traditional Latin Mass had to be abandoned. And now just recently he came out with another uh, statement in which he was basically uh, rebuking the bishops for not enforcing uh, the letter of his, of his law. Uh, there were bishops, I guess, uh, in the Novus Ordo who were allowing the certain groups to continue having the 1962 Latin liturgy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think Francis actually cited uh, a, a, one of the canons of their, the modern, the 1983 Code of Canon Law, that these bishops were, were appealing to, mm -hmm. why they didn't have to crush the Latin Mass, mm -hmm. the yeah. traditional Latin Mass, in their dioceses. And this is Canon 87. Uh, it says, this is the new code that these bishops were saying, an author allows them to continue allowing the traditional Latin Mass. <clears throat> it says, whenever he judges that it contributes to their spiritual welfare, the diocesan bishop can dispense the faithful from disciplinary laws, both universal laws and those particular laws made by the supreme ecclesiastical authority for his territory or his subjects. He cannot dispense from procedural laws or from penal laws, nor from those whose dispensation is specially reserved to the apostolic see or to some other authority. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and it even continues, if recourse to the Holy See is difficult, and at the same time there is danger of grave harm and delay, any ordinary can dispense from these laws, even if the dispensation is reserved to the Holy See, provided the dispensation is one which the Holy See customarily grants in the same circumstances and without prejudice to Canon 291. Now that's uh, the new Code of Canon Law of 1983, that's John Paul II, Canon 87. And Francis has just come out and uh, kind of blasted the diocesan bishops who have been appealing to that canon of their new Code of Canon Law to justify their permitting the traditional Latin Mass to continue in the dioceses. Uh, Francis says that's not legitimate, and he forbids it. So he insists that the bishops follow through with a letter of his uh, anti-Catholic traditionis custodes. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, again, I mean, it, it seems so odd to me that you have these very uh, traditional Latin mass groups of the 1962 liturgy with the early John the 23rd changes, uh, pointing the finger and, uh, and, and blaming the traditional priests who've been actually holding the line all these years uh, for not having the authority of the Vatican when the authority of, well, Francis is coming down trying to annihilate them. Mm -hmm. uh, if one were to admit uh, their argument then one would say, okay, Francis has the right to annihilate the traditional Latin Mass. We have to agree that he can simply uh, forbid it, not give anyone permission to say it. We'd all have to obey it, and we'd have to, just the church would have to entirely give up the traditional Latin Mass. Um, now, you know, if they're going to blame the traditional priests who functioned all those years with nothing but uh, opposition and condemnation, 
if they're going to blame them now for what they did then, um, well, then the, the only other conclusion is they agree that, uh, uh, you know, the, the life or death authority over the traditional Latin Mass um, is held by Francis to either grant it or, or, or crush it. We don't believe that. We simply don't believe it because it's a matter of sacred tradition, which is greater than any pope and even the papacy itself. Uh, comes to us through divine revelation and uh, depends upon and exists for the sake of protecting sacred tradition, not destroying it. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- I think they're all totally mixed up. And uh, it, it just it just seems like hubris to me for them to say, well, we have the author- authorization now to use it. So if you don't have that authorization, you're bad mm-hmm. and you're schismatic. When, uh, as I say, they wouldn't even have it at all if there weren't priests who went ahead and held on to it through, through, you know, the, the stormiest times and braved all of the, all of the opprobrium and condemnations of the modernists. Uh, they should be grateful to them, not condemning them and saying that they were right all along. But in, in any case, uh, that's my own thought on the yeah. subject. Well, it seems abundantly clear, Father, that your position, the traditional Catholic position, is the only reasonable one because... You know, I, I remember when Summarum Pontificum came out, how um, it, when it was issued, there, there was so much excitement, you know, among the quote-unquote mm-hmm. conservative um, Novus Ordo Catholics who, you know, kind of flung this in the face of traditional Catholics and used this argument and said, you know, why, why are you now, like, what is your excuse for not being in the, in the Novus Ordo when here we have permission for this? But we see how, how fickle and, and silly that, that authorization is because the next quote unquote pope can come in and just take that away mm-hmm. and that's such a, a silly basis um, exactly once you admit that they have the right to do that then you're saying the use of the traditional latin mass is not a right but a privilege mm-hmm. and a privilege can be can be taken away at a moment's notice and you have to acknowledge that well they have we acknowledge they had the authority to grant it so we have to acknowledge they had the authority to deny it too mm-hmm. but father to what, what happens to these um conservative novus ordo catholics who want so badly to, to stick to this idea that, you know, we have to have permission from uh, the Holy Father to, to offer the, the traditional Latin Mass that they love so dearly, cherish so much, are so devoted to, and now he comes in, takes it away, rips it away from them. Well, but I they mean, still insist, on the other hand, that he is the Holy Father, we must follow him. Well, what what if, do they do? If they're honest about that, then they'd have to give it up and say, oh, well, I guess, uh, you know, uh, we recognize Francis as being the Pope, the whole Pope and nothing but the Pope, and he has the authority to do so. We, so we have to accept whatever he decides at any given moment. We have to accept it uh, without question. And whatever he decides to do, uh, we have to uh, bow down to it and accept it. If he decides to um, change the faith, that's what we have to do. If he decides to order us to abandon Catholic tradition and follow him in his Synod of Synodality and, and where that's going. If we, if, if we have to accept, uh, um, you know, homosexual uh, supporting bishops and uh, the clergy that go with them and accept that as the new normal, we have to do that because Francis says we have to do that. This is their concept of, of the papacy under Francis. Of course, it's not the Catholic papacy. Francis has no concept of the Catholic papacy, at least nothing he believes in. If one were to present the Catholic concept of the papacy to Francis, he would reject it. He would condemn it. Um, he's inventing his own papacy, according to, uh, uh, according to Francis. Mm-hmm. So, um, but if, they were, if these people who, uh, you know, as they say, condemn those who, try, who continue practicing the faith and its integrity with the traditional true Latin Mass, pre-1962 <laughs> changes, and... Um, the, who uh, administer the two traditional Roman Rite sacraments, and um, uh, according to the the, the ceremonies of, of the of the traditional Catholic Rite, and those who teach the traditional Catholic faith, if they condemn them because they say that well they're not authorized to do that, then as soon as Francis turns around and says well you're not authorized to do it either, so stop it. Logically, if they were honest, they'd have to say okay, we'll we'll give it up. We'll give it all up. We'll just follow Francis. Uh, I think they would probably, many of them, show that they were not honest in that because I think when it came down to it, 
uh, that they would opt in favor of the faith and say, we're not going to give up our faith for you or anyone, you know. Um, you have, don't have any th authority, real authority to prevent it, to forbid it. But I don't know. I don't know what they would do. Wow. Um, very sad situation. I don't see a lot of integrity in their position, honestly. No. Uh, somebody uh, actually came to see me here a few years ago and said they'd been up and, rep and, and visited the fraternity of St. Peter representative not far from here and talked to him. And he made the case, well, look, you know, at Immaculate Conception, they don't have the, the approval of Rome. They don't have the approval of the Holy Father to do what they're doing. And so they're schismatics and they're outside the church. And this is forbidden for them, you know, to represent themselves as Catholic and so on. And um, he was saying, but we, on the other hand, the fraternity of St. Peter, we have the authority to do so. We have the authorization. We have the approval. And uh, so everything is, is right with us that is wrong with them. And this, this person told me, they then asked him, well, what would you do if Francis forbade you to offer the traditional Mass and insisted you had to accept and, and say only the new Mass? His answer was, well, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Just like that, well, I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, so much for this vaunted authority they, they say they're, they're operating under. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see the integrity there, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wow, what I, I don't know what they would that. do. Sad state. <laughs> they have to decide whether they're going to be Catholic or or modernist and just follow Francis. And, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, great Sindel Church. There was another question in the same vein, uh, similar similar uh, line of questioning, Father. Some of our viewers want to know why you continue to say that receiving Holy Communion in the hand is a sacrilege, uh, when in the very first days of the Church that was the standard and normal normal way for the faithful to receive the host. And uh, I believe St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century mentioned something about communion in the hand. So practice obviously goes way back. Why do you say, Father, that this is a sacrilege? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, in the Mystagogica Catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, in the middle of the three, uh, 300s, after 4th century, uh, there is mention of the reception of communion in the hand. It's true. And I remember when I was still a seminarian, uh, seeing a pamphlet that was being distributed by my, well, changing church at the time. Uh, the pamphlet actually uh, had on its cover a, a citation of that mystagogic catechesis of, uh, of St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, the pamphlet was about the practice of hand communion, and it was introducing the, the practice and making the case that it was truly a Catholic practice. Remember, the modernists whole ploy was to try to um, restore primitive Christianity. Their idea was we have to rediscover primitive Christianity and strip away all of these medieval accretions and historical additions that had come in, uh, demythologize things, go back to the, the real root, basic, fundamental Christianity of the early centuries. And the way they would discover that was by basically just peeling away all the things that the church had added and, and practices of the church throughout the centuries before that. Pope Pius XII actually condemned that. He called it archaeologism, trying to resurrect or dig up the old, you know, the old practice. He said it was wrong. And curiously enough, at the same time he was saying it was wrong, he did approve of a, a commission to examine and change the liturgy, and that produced the new Holy Greek Rites. So there was a contradiction going on. But we've seen a lot of that in the Novus Ordo. It's built upon lies. The whole Novus Ordo is built upon lies. And so this, this uh, appeal to the mystagogic catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem is also a lie. <clears throat> Why do I say that? Well, because... It is a fact that in uh, Book 5 of this uh, catechesis, and again, this, this was a catechism, an instruction that was prepared by St. Cyril of Jerusalem for converts who were becoming Catholics. And uh, in Book 5 of that catechism, uh, he, there is this entry about making a throne to receive the host with your left hand, and you devoutly receive 
and you take it with your right hand and you place it in your mouth, the host can communion. Careful not to lose any of the particles. It makes a point of that. Careful not to lose any of the particles of the host. And it talks about, you know, receiving the chalice from the chalice and so on. So again, receiving under both species. This is what we were seeing on the front of this pamphlet. This is what was being printed in the Nova Soto literature to convince everyone that hand communion was truly a, a standard go-to Catholic practice and it was perfectly fine. This is a matter of restoring the primitive practice of Christianity. Well, uh, uh, fine and good until you start looking into this. And when you start examining the matter, you find it's not exactly the way they represented it. Because if you go to the actual text of the Catechism, the Mystagogica Catechesis, Book 5, and it is available. I mean, one can go online now and find it. In those days, though, I'd have to go back to the library <clears throat> of a Catholic university and look for the Minya, the Petrologia Greca, um, and actually look up the original the Greek wording. And it's very interesting to see what it says. <clears throat> it goes from make a throne to receive, you know, the Lord with your left hand and then take the host with your right hand and place it devoutly in your mouth and take the particles, you then receive of the chalice. But then it goes on and it says, and then with the moisture of the precious, of the precious blood from the chalice on your lips, wipe it off with your fingers and rub it into your ears and your eyes. That's not a Catholic practice. That's never been a Catholic practice, right? Anywhere. And it turns out when you begin to examine this text, you find out that scholars, patristic scholars, have questioned the legitimacy, the authenticity of this book five of the Mystagogica Catechesis, suspecting that it was written actually not by Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, but by the semi-Arian heretic John who succeeded him as Bishop of Jerusalem that he introduced this practice. And here's the Novus Ordo cutting off the quote and just giving it to you as it is without actually telling you the rest of the story. If they did, people would say, there's something wrong with this. They would know there's something wrong with it. And uh, it is all by design. It's not an accident. They know exactly what they're doing. They're deceiving people. The entire Novus, Novus Ordo is, is a lie. It's based upon lies and misrepresentations. But you know, Tom, the whole idea, again, I mean, even with the modernists, the modernists were saying, let's go back to primitive Christianity and try to restore what it was back then. At the same time, the modernists are saying, but, you know, the faith does change. The practice of the faith changes. As the faith changes, the religion must change, okay? Because the religion is the practice of the faith, okay? So the, the modernist principle of the very foundation of all their, all their, uh, their system is that faith is an experience. You experience the divine. Each individual does that. And each generation does it in its own way. And that experience changes with time. It evolves with time. Our experience of the divine is not what the apostles experienced. It's not what Jesus experienced. We've evolved beyond that experience, right? So we have today our modern experience of God, and that is who God is. We are experiencing God who actually is as he is now. And so it is that each successive generation is going to have its own experience of God in its own particular way. And that, in fact, will be the true identity of God at that time. Uh, and so here they are uh, launching this modernist idea about this perpetually evolving faith without really doctrines that are uh, unchangeable truths. Francis is the prime representative of that. He, he condemns the very idea of doctrine. He's, he's spoken out clearly in his rejection of the very concept of doctrine, unchangeable truth, that it is evolving that the church must live and evolve and change, the faith must live and evolve and change, the practice of the faith, the religion, must evolve and change. The modernist says, if it doesn't, it will die. Anything that doesn't change and evolve is going to die. 
So they say that they're actually saving the church from death by basically rejecting the doctrines of the past, reject, rejecting the practices of the, of the faith, the religion of the past, and changing it and moving on and having it reflect more modern man's mentality of who God is or should be. And um, the, this they're saying, by the way, at the same time they intend to restore the primitive Christianity which they basically say we've all evolved, evolved from. Now, do you see a certain contradiction in this idea of the evolving futuristic uh, religion, but at the same time saying we're going to go back and, and resurrect primitive Christianity? I mean, which is it with them? You know, It's like you can't do both unless you have a mind that is disordered and irrational and doesn't believe in the principle of non-contradiction. Um, they're actually thinking, evidently, that as the um, religion of the world, because that's they're talking about the religions of the world, all experiencing God in their own way, and they're all converging into a one world religion through ecumenism, they actually seem to think that the religion they're all going to rediscover is that primitive Christianity that was left behind at the beginning what they imagine to be the real Christianity. But it's a cr purely a creature of their imagination. It doesn't really exist in history. It's what they say primitive Christianity should have been, and that's what they say they're going to recreate now as we evolve into that now in the future. Um, Francis in, is entirely on board with that. His synod on synodality is all about this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. With it, with the uh, added feature, the cherry on top, the LGBTQIA agenda, that he's bringing that into the modern church. The modernist church really is all about establishing that as the norm. I'm, I'm sure of it, absolutely. And this is, uh, I believe this is exactly why the FBI now is targeting traditional Catholics, because they know traditional Catholics are opposed to that. They're opposed to abortion, and they're opposed to the LGBTQIA plus um, whole world, basically what they want to turn the world into. Basically a gigantic um, abortionist and uh, uh, homosexual society, as all as a matter of, of controlling its population. So uh, I, I believe the, the FBI is being actually... Um, dominated with this with this program and that is why they see traditional catholics as the enemy because we do not agree with that program and actually we oppose it and archbishop vigano recently wrote about that as well father so and archbishop vigano yes has written very powerfully against that true and uh one should read that actually saying that it's a it's a logical consequence i think it was his term that uh this fbi um you know uh, right. He just came out with that, right? Yeah, yeah. Focusing on, on traditional Catholics when uh, that's just a logical consequence of Francis and the rhetoric and the, the things that he's done mm -hmm. against traditional Catholics. That's FBI right. Just... He does actually connect that with the FBI's uh, surveillance of traditional Catholics with Francis's rhetoric against them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that ties it all together pretty well, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They've all got the same program. Yeah. And they're all working uh, together for it and against the traditional Catholic faith yeah. and the religion, which is its practice. Yeah. Um, well, Father, we also wanted to um, mention um, any update on the uh, the train derailment in uh, East Palestine, Ohio, mm -hmm. here and the burning of the vinyl chloride and some of the other chemicals there and how those have been spreading in the air mm -hmm. and the, the water. We heard uh, just um, last week that this toxic plume, I guess, reached us here in Cincinnati. They shut off the water intakes here. But um, it seems that um, there is, uh, I was just mentioning this earlier, Father, it seems every time we turn on the news now, there's some new story of some mm -hmm. train derailment or um, a semi-carrying chemicals has mm -hmm. has, uh, has turn turned has over. derailed and uh, we're, uh, what's his name? Uh, but a, but a jig, but a jig. I, I, uh, the, uh, yeah, you know. Buttigieg. Yeah, whatever, whatever he is. Yeah. Uh, this uh, so-called uh, transportation transportation secretary. secretary yeah. Mm -hmm. 
has said, well, you know, there are a thousand train derailments every year, yeah, so I mean, yeah. what's what's this? Yeah. But we're reading about them every day now. Yeah. And there was even an 18 inch, an 18 inch pipe bomb discovered on the tracks of a train. I think it was in Philadelphia, <clears throat> by a church there. Um, so I mean, it's getting to stretch the 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 uh, limits of credulity or credibility, I should say, uh, that this is all accidental. At a time when, you know, food processing plants are being torched, uh, factories are blowing up, right, mm -hmm. uh, around the country, and now train derailments, um, the country's under attack from within, okay? Meanwhile, we're looking at balloons, and, and we're sending up $200 million aircraft to shoot half a million dollar missiles to shoot down a twelve dollar balloon uh, uh, by a hobbyist club, in, you know. And um, but we're all supposed to be focusing on these balloons. And uh, are they spy balloons? Well, some of them might be. At least one or two of them might be spy balloons. But I'm much more concerned about the Chinese agents who are at our universities, uh, working day and night to subvert this country and to attack this country, than I am about the balloons flying overhead. I mean, I'd, I'd much rather see what's going on in our colleges and universities. Um, uh, research that is being done and wired back to uh, China um, by their agents here in this country uh, because of the collusion of our own lawmakers <clears throat> uh, and government officials. Uh, that to me is a much more concern, a great, greater concern. And I think. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to find that all of these events I've just mentioned are somehow tied with those agents at work in our country to destabilize our, our society. Um, so, but as far as the, uh, the derailment at East Palestine, um, there are many who question it. Um, some of them actually know a bit about toxic chemicals and their transport by rail. Um, and how they should be handled. They question the idea of burning this off. And, uh, but, but then <coughs> once, once it happened and this was actually spilling into the waterways, um, the, uh, maybe it was the mayor of East Palestine. Uh, no, actually, I think it, it might have been the, the governor of Ohio asked uh, the federal government to come in and to uh, actually bring aid and support and relief <laughs> to the area, and FEMA refused because they said this was not really an unusual occurrence, something to that effect. And then Donald Trump said, I will come and I will visit the area myself, because Biden would not, nor would uh, Pete B, uh, come down and visit it. The federal government was showing no interest whatsoever. Uh, people were saying that's because these people voted for Trump. These are Trump voters here. And they were like by a vast, a big wide margin, they were Trump voters. And you are not interested in helping them for that very reason. So when Trump said, I will go and I will visit the site, then all of a sudden FEMA changed the tune and said, we're coming. Okay. Now, honestly, what I, I would ask, do you really want the federal government involved in this? Do you really trust them to make this better, to make this right? Anyway, that's just a question I would, I would pose. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, um, I, I understand that the, the toxic chemicals, chemicals that get into the waterway are making their way through Cincinnati. Cincinnati closed the intakes <clears throat> so that this would not get into the water supply. It's supposed to take uh, two weeks to actually wash through the Ohio and down the river through Cincinnati. I, that's what I'd read. I don't know, um, you know, but the, but the science of it is. But uh, I'd read it will take two weeks for it to clear out entirely. But then it's going to be floating down river. There are other societies down there that are going to have to deal with it, towns and and uh, villages and cities and so on. So, um, but uh, you know, all the time the reassurance there's nothing to worry about here. But uh, so so much so that. Uh, Joseph Biden makes a mystery, mystery trip to the Ukraine and uh, having pledged not one dime for the relief of the, of the people who suffered the consequences of this toxic burn off and spill in East Palestine, he's promising $500 million 
to the, the basically Nazi Ukrainian government um, in, in terms of missiles and armaments. Um, and, um, you know, this American taxpayer payer money is going to that. Um, and even there was talk about now taking the responsibility for paying the pensions of Ukrainian pensioners who uh, will, will need support, that the American people are going to be responsible for paying their pensions now. Um, you know, one question that looms large in all this is the question of Hunter Biden and Joe Biden's effect, the big guy, their involvement in Ukraine before this ever happened, and the monies that were being paid by the, Ukrainian, the Ukrainians to the Biden family. And with all of the, literally about $50 billion of American money that have gone to this Ukrainian government, which is unaccounted for, we do not have an accounting for this money. Uh, one wonders where it has gone. And it is not unfair to ask, uh, has any of that money washed back here into the, into the pockets of politicians, notably certain politicians? You know? Why is this mania for giving billions and billions of dollars to them? And what have they done with it? We don't know. We don't know. So, uh, but the people of East Palestine and other areas of our country are suffering right now from this um, assault. Um, and uh, we see who matters, you know. Um, you know, we'd have to say that American lives don't matter to certain, to certain people. <clears throat> and unfortunately, they're, they're in power right now. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Tom, uh, enough of that, right? <laughs> but um, uh, we we had a question come in at one point about uh, the the book, The Lord of the World, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have you received a series of questions about this, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in the past, we've talked about that somewhat, right? And uh, but I and I don't know if the questioner is aware of the fact that we've dealt with some of these questions already. But maybe we could just well, quickly run through them. Uh, some, I imagine, would have to be addressed later because we can't address them all right now. But maybe we can address some of them. Sure. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, first one, Father, will the Antichrist be born into his role as the Antichrist or will he eventually have to deliberately and intentionally choose that path? Will he know that he is the Antichrist? Well, uh, let's go back to the title, The Lord of the World. <clears throat> The book that prompts that question was published in 1907. The author was Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson. His father had been an Archbishop of Canterbury in the Anglican Church, right? And uh, Robert Hugh Benson was a convert to the Catholic faith, and he became a priest. He died, I think, in 1914, if I'm not mistaken, at a re relatively young age. <clears throat> He's published quite a number of novels, which are very good about the, the Catholics living in Elizabethan England and suffering before their faith. A very inspiring heroic novels that he wrote. And um, he also wrote a book called The Lord of the World in which he, he talked about the coming of the Antichrist into the world. And that's what we're talking about here. And that's why that question has to do with the Antichrist. <clears throat> uh, for those who haven't read uh, Monsignor Robert U. Benson's The Lord of the World, I think you'd find it to be very interesting. Those who have read it, but not recently, uh, again, might do well to read it again because it is quite prophetic about the world that we're living in right now. Flying machines and uh, air, air transport and so on, and what we would even recognize as like fax machines. He was talking about... Uh, uh, and um, also um, euthanasia euthanasia houses, death houses, where people go to uh, follow through on their wish to commit suicide, uh, uh, suicide machines that are provided, almost like a religious cult. And uh, into this world comes the Antichrist, but it's particularly applicable, it seems, because the Antichrist appears on the world stage at a time when the world is in crisis of conflict between the East and the West. Now, this is 1907. This is before World War I. But the fear at that time, as the novel portrays it, was that the entire world was going to be plunged into war 
the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere would be engaged in a, in a battle to, to annihilation. And uh, all the nations of the world, all the peoples of the world were, were terrified by this prospect of this, this, this conflict. And there appears suddenly uh, on the world stage a very virtually unknown figure who, who actually brings peace. How he does that? Well, read the novel, you'll find out how he does that. But he's acclaimed by the world. from his faith. And uh, that's not brought out in the book, just the name. The name seems to uh, you know, correspond to that, that uh, prophecy, prophecies regarding to this. And uh, the question there is whether uh, when he was born in the world, he knew he was the Antichrist. Right? And uh, I don't know, but I would tell you what I think. The novel itself doesn't say that I recall, that when Julian Felsenberg was born, he had like 666, uh, like uh, tattooed on his head, <laughs> like the omen, I think it was, or uh, that he uh, could speak multiple languages on the day he was born or anything like that, uh, that there was any indication that he was uh, possessed. <clears throat> but uh, I personally don't think that he would know and have that consciousness because as a child and a human child he would have the limitations of a human brain he's not divine this is where we sometimes make a mistake in thinking that he's the counterpart of the son of god incarnate the antichrist is not he's an antichrist that's true but saint john says that anyone who denies jesus christ is the lord and savior and the, the god made man is an antichrist okay but uh, this man is not just an antichrist he is the antichrist because of the extreme wickedness that he would have been so perfectly possessed and completely uh, uh, abandoned to the will of uh, of satan but it doesn't make him a divine being he's still only a creature even as lucifer himself is only a creature and uh, he's finite he would not have the consciousness, as it were, of, of, of a divine being when he's born. That would be something that would have to develop over time. And his perversion would have to grow and grow and grow throughout his lifetime until he uh, <clears throat> finally has become so utterly perverted uh, that he completely abandons his will um, to the power of Satan. There, there's such a thing as imperfect possession where somebody gives power over him to himself to Satan. But that does not equate with possession. Uh, possession is basically more along the lines of perfect possession when the person has actually abandoned his will to Satan, welcomed him in and said, take me, I'm yours. Okay, so he has abandoned all resistance and completely surrenders himself to Satan's power. And that will be the son of perdition. That will be the Antichrist. But I think it's something that will be a gradual process. But that's just my thought. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been reading uh, Father Kramer's book, right? The Book of Destiny. Do you know of anything in his book that would shed light on that? 
No, um, not not that I recall, Father. It's been some time since I read that, but um, I think the general understanding was that um, that uh, as you say, he will not necessarily be be born with this knowledge, but at some point in his life, there will be some kind of uh, pact that's that's yeah. made um, with the devil himself, uh, make, thus making this individual the Antichrist. But I think um, my understanding, at least, that that's the general consensus, and that's I think what Father Kramer says. Mm -hmm. um, so he's not necessarily born with that knowledge. Um, but the next question, Father, how will the elect recognize the Antichrist? Uh, well, the elect will, will recognize the Antichrist because of the power that he will assume over the world and people who hail him as their savior, their new savior. And we expect that the various religions of the world, including the new order, uh, the Novus Ordo, uh, will uh, acknowledge him as the actual new savior of the world. Um, the new order might even acknowledge, say that he is the Christ returned, you know. But we find that the various religions, including the Muslim, look for the return of the Mahdi, and the, the Buddhist look for the return of the Bodhisattva, right? Bodhisattva, I'm sorry, I've had a hard time pronouncing that. Bodhisattva is like a reincarnation of the Buddha, right? And um, that, that they're looking for this, this great savior to come into the world. And there's a certain convergence of these ideas. The theosophists um, talk about the coming of Lord Maitreya to teach mankind its own divinity. That's certainly uh, a, a, a diabolical message, right? It's what Lucifer brought into the Garden of Eden with him long ago. It's the message that is going to be brought by the, by their so-called Lord Maitreya, and so um, what what appears to be happening, is the stage is being set for the various religious bodies, all looking forward to the arrival, of this great figure, and they're all going to find the answer to their expectation in the arrival of this one figure, this one, seemingly superhuman figure who will uh, basically be represented by him uh, himself uh, as the perfect man. Um, and um, that he has the right to lead mankind then in this, 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 this worship of the human race and, um, and the mother earth goddess who gave birth to them. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Apparent superhuman status, Father. Will the Antichrist have any weak spots? Uh, well, of course, uh, pride is the biggest weak spot of all. We say pride comes before the fall, and pride is a kind of madness, right? And uh, it, it sets it sets us up for not only uh, failure; it sets us up for humiliating failure. And the failure of the Antichrist will be the ultimate humiliation. Of, of Satan, really. It's ultimate failure. Remember what the book uh, of the Apocalypse says, sometimes people call it the book of Revelation, <clears throat> um, that when our Lord comes, uh, he will bashfully blow away the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Just like, you know, in the old days as children, we'd pick up the dandelions and we'd just blow on them and they would just kind of disperse. Remember that? Or, if there was a smoke, a puff of smoke, we'd, we'd blow it and just make it disappear. And that's kind of the imagery we have here of our Lord blowing away this Antichrist as though he was just a puff of smoke and there was nothing to him. The one who seems so invincible in one moment appears to be just nothing uh, before the power of Christ. Um, so, uh, yes, he certainly will have weaknesses, his weakness will be his pride that will be his undoing, as it was for Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Will the uh, will the Antichrist be able to see the souls of people? Will he have any other powers? Well, insofar world? as he is possessed by the demon, uh, probably many demons, right? Uh, those demons would have the power to uh, know souls to some extent, you know. I mean, we think about the, the angels, like our guardian angels, they see our souls before they see our bodies. They see our bodies insofar as our bodies are substantially united to our souls. <clears throat> and uh, they see 
our souls more as God sees us than as we see ourselves. And um, that's, a, that's a very great help, uh, of course. On the other hand, um, Satan, the fallen angels, actually see uh, also spiritual beings. They see us spiritually first. So they do see our souls. They don't see our souls with the clarity and perfection that God sees them, obviously. They do not see them necessarily even with the clarity and perfection of, that our guardian angels see our souls. Mm -hmm. But they do see our souls. And especially they see our weaknesses. And they even see our sins, that are the, the, the guilt that is that are on our souls because of our sins. In exorcisms, they, they make a big display of that. Right? Um, now, the, the demons that possess... Could they be able to see ourselves? I don't know if they would actually see them with a vision, but they certainly, they know who they're dealing with. Let's put it that way. Um, let's face it, if they possess a soul, if they possess a body, it's because the soul has welcomed them and embraced them to some extent. And so they, they know the condition of the soul of the person they're possessing. Uh, so would the... Um, would the Antichrist uh, be able to read the souls as men? No. To read the souls of those around him? As men? No. Would he be able to know the wickedness of the souls around him? Um, well, through the power, uh, the spiritual power of the possessing demon and uh, fallen angels, he can be aware, of, well aware of it. Yeah. Okay. Will the Antichrist convince Catholics, uh, many Catholics, to follow him? And if so, how will he do that? Yes, he will. Well, well, let me put it this way. False Catholics, he will. <clears throat> weak and unstable and, well, Catholics of, of weak faith, he will convince. Um, you know, the very famous passage, passage about the coming of the Antichrist in St. Paul's second Epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, something we should consult, something all Catholics should be familiar with. Uh, St. Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, who believed that Christ's return to judge the world was imminent. And St. Paul was writing to tell them, no, it's not imminent, it won't come yet. In fact, St. Paul says there are certain things that must happen before Christ returns to judge. And then St. Paul explains to them what those things are. He mentions a great apostasy, a great falling away from the faith, which is very interesting because when St. Paul was writing those words, there were not an enormous number of faithful people. The church was still very small. And so if he's prophesying a great loss of faith, he's also simultaneously, by implication, <clears throat> prophesying that there would be a great growth in faith. <clears throat> So that there could be then subsequently a great loss of faith. Um, but he said the Antichrist will come after this great loss of faith. And he will deceive the world with his displays of power. Uh, St. Paul referred to the, the, the restrainer who was holding him back. But the restrainer would be taken out of the way. And then the Antichrist could come into the world. And do his damage. And there's a lot of speculation with regard to the restrainer. He's referred to in one place by the neuter, in another place as though he were a thing, in another place in the masculine as though he were a person. You know, and there are speculations about uh, who he might be as a person, uh, or what he might be as a thing. Some say that he would be. It would be the Blessed Sacrament that would restrain. The, the Antichrist, and when the Blessed Sacrament was taken out of the way, that the Antichrist could move, could make his move. So, again, speculation. The Church hasn't pronounced authoritatively on any of these things yet. <clears throat> but, um, but our Lord said, when he spoke of these things, that um, they may be mysterious to us now, but when they happen, it's important that we have, he told us about these things in advance so that when they happen, we may recognize them. So... Uh, there are those who claim to recognize those events even now. In fact, Pope Pius X, when he was elected Pope, in his first encyclical, said that he recognized events in the world that would indicate that those times are upon us. That was in 1903. Uh, so it's not idle speculation, certainly. 
But uh, St. Paul ends Second Thessalonians chapter 2 by talking about the elect, the eclectoi, the elect souls of God, who will be chosen souls, and they will not be deceived by the Antichrist, whereas others would be. And he said there are others who would be deceived by the Antichrist because they received not the love of the truth. And because they did not have the love of truth, God abandoned them, sort of like the Egyptians of old. <clears throat> they were given up to a spirit of error, to the lying, the lying spirit of error, which is what they chose. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and so simply, God actually simply seated them to uh, their choice, their own choice. But the, the meaning is, of course, that those who love the truth, the chosen souls of God who will remain faithful, will be uh, faithful because they love the truth. And that will immunize them against the deceit of the Antichrist. Their love for the truth will protect them from the deceit of the greatest deceiver in the history of mankind. Right? And um, St. Paul closes by saying, uh, in, in light of all this, uh, hold fast to the traditions that you've received, he says, either by word of mouth or by written or epistle or by writing. Well, writing is scripture and word of mouth is tradition. So he's saying, hold fast to what you've received of the faith by sacred scripture and sacred tradition. That's his advice. That's what he tells the Thessalonians and by extension, all of us to do, even in those times of the Antichrist, we'll be safe if we love the truth and we hold fast to sacred scripture and sacred tradition. How does one know if he loves the truth, Father? Well, uh, you know, we're, we're hard pressed to judge ourselves because we, we tend to judge others more critically and judge ourselves more gently. We tend to excuse ourselves and we tend to be very unwilling to, uh, shall we say, excuse others for what they do. We have a hard time examining our own consciences, but we are really expert at examining everybody else's conscience. You know? And this is part of original sin. Um, <clears throat> so that's a very good question. How does one know? Well, I think one can know in a sense, because first of all, one has to pray for that. It's a grace from God to love the truth. Our Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says to Pilate, I came into the world to bear witness to the truth, and anyone who is of the truth heareth my voice. So, in being faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, we are being faithful to the truth. <clears throat> but how do we know that our fidelity is to him and not just to our own personal inclinations? <clears throat> I, I think uh, one, if, if one prays for that grace to love the truth above all, to love God above all, and uh, then one says about practicing his faith without excuse and without a compromise, and he's willing to pay the price for being faithful, um, then that's the best indication he has that he loves the truth. If he's inclined to compromise what he believes is right, uh, if he's inclined to compromise with the Novus Ordo, for example, <clears throat> I think that's a warning shot sign to him that his love is not of the truth first and foremost. <clears throat> If he believes something is the right thing to do, but because of family pressure or fear of the loss of friends or social standing or maybe employment, <clears throat> he finds that he's uh, being sorely tempted to abandon his faith, <clears throat> to live a lie, to at least even outwardly go along with something he knows is not true or fears is not true or even come out right and profess something that he knows is not true just for the sake of you know getting along in the world i think that's a very clear indication that he does not love the truth if he's willing to uh, be loyal and faithful in speaking the truth and then living in accordance with what he believes is true he's not a hypocrite and I think that is the, the, the most solid indication he has that he loves the truth more than anything else because he's willing to part with other things and sacrifice other things in favor of the truth. Whenever it, come, it comes down to a choice of what he believes is true 
or some convenience or benefit he received, by living the lie, he always chooses to be faithful to what he believes is true, to, his, to the conscience that he has. Then I think he has a pretty good indication that he really does love the truth. I mean, if, if I may, example, St. Thomas More. St. Thomas More was very, very worried. He wasn't worried about, you know, doubting God's uh, fidelity. He wasn't worried about uh, what would happen, uh, you know, <laughs> to this or that or the other thing as a result of his position, is taking his stand against, against Henry's uh, invalid marriage. Uh, or against Henry claiming to be the head of the church in England, he was worried that he would not have the strength to stand up for what he believed in. He was very worried about him, his own weakness and caving in under the pressure of interrogation and threats. And uh, this is actually borne out in the movie A Man for All Seasons, when his daughter Meg met him, when he returned from... Uh, I guess it was uh, probably Hampton Court where he was being interrogated um, by the Duke of Norfolk and uh, uh, Bishop Cramner, right, of uh, Canterbury and, uh, and uh, uh, actually uh, Cramner, the, um, what, am, what am I thinking of here? Well, uh, like Thomas. Uh, Thomas Cramner? Cramner, yes, thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, senior moment here. Um, and in any case, he was being interrogated uh, about his beliefs and why he would not sign the oath of supremacy, signed to it. Um, and when he stood his ground and he did not cave in, he was very happy. So happy, in fact, so lighthearted that his daughter Meg thought everything went well and he was out of danger. In fact, he was in the worst danger imaginable, and he knew it. But his happiness was uh, not because he was free of danger externally, but he was free of danger internally in the sense that he knew his faith and his love for our Lord were strong enough to sustain all of that uh, pressure. That's why he was so happy, and he made it clear to Meg that that's why, and that he was not out of danger from the king, but... He was just happy that he had stood his ground and been faithful to Christ. And I, I think that tells us there, uh, gives us an example of a, a man who has come to realize that he really did love the truth enough to stand for it uh, without, without apology, without excuse, without flinching. <clears throat> and uh, I think Thomas More is a very good example for us to follow in our own day. Absolutely. Well, Father, we have several more of these, but um, perhaps... It's okay with you. We save these for next week. Uh, we can. As long as we do, I think they'll be holding us to it. Right? All right. Let's plan okay. on it. Well, Father, thanks for everything tonight. We think we covered a lot of ground in this program. But I think we did. Yeah. Thanks, thanks to you. Um, yes. And a blessed, <laughs> so, uh, blessed uh, Lenten season to you, Father. You yes. Ash Wednesday, uh, Ash Wednesday is tomorrow. Yeah. I wish you all a blessed Lenten season, too. We do have a little, I guess, a video clip on uh, that very subject, don't we? Available. Right. So. Right. Uh, Perhaps people could consult that. Mm -hmm. They would like some guidance on how to spend a good Lent. That's right. I do recommend that they read, a, out of devotion, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 every day during Lent so that by the end of the Lenten season, they know it by heart and they can put it into practice. That would be a Lent well spent in order to, uh, to know 1 Corinthians 13 and to live it. Okay. Well, thank you, Father. God bless you. God bless you, Tom, and Thanks. all of our viewers. Yes, thank you to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.